It's hard to believe it's, you know, Thanksgiving time. It's right around the corner. The weather's cooperating. Today, if you have a Bible, let me ask you to open to Psalm 92. We're going to do a message that kind of, well, not kind of, but centers on gratitude and thanksgiving as we step into this time, this season. And I think that um, we should pray. So, Lord, as we open your word once again, uh, what a privilege it is to just open your word together. Help us to never take for granted that freedom we have and the opportunity to hear you speak to us personally and corporately through it. May our hearts be open. May there always be a continued transformation going on in each of our hearts because of your written and spoken word to us. So, Lord, speak today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 92, verse 1, starts off by saying something very simple but very powerful. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. It's good to give thanks. Bill Gates, one of the richest men in America right now, uh, was asked a question by a medical doctor. He, he, as you know, delves into the medical world. Bill Gates does quite a bit. And he was asked a question by a medical doctor who also had a PhD in philosophy. And he was in this medical seminar, and someone raised their hand and, and says, Bill, if you were blind, would you trade all your billions to have your sight restored? And Bill Gates answered very quickly, and he said, I would trade all my money for sight. And, you know, we, we have these, these, these unbelievable abilities to, to see, to hear, most of you, uh, <laughs> mobility. You, you've got this, this, this amazing experience of touch, hands and fingers and health. And, and I think sometimes we just need to stop and, and realize what a priceless gift that is because Bill Gates said this. He says, you know, I can make more money. I can't make more eyes. Now, you know, in Proverbs chapter 20, it says the, the hearing and the seeing uh, were made both by God. God makes these things. And, and the opening verse there in, in Psalm 92 is such a simple but powerful statement. It's, 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 it's basically someone who, who has a deep sense of gratitude and thankfulness for who the Lord is, a sense of pleasure in just knowing him. It's good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. It's a, it's a natural response based on all his goodness and his grace that he has given to us. I believe that a believer's life should be characterized by gratitude and thankfulness. A sense of gratitude and, and thankfulness to the Lord and not be known or marked as being a complainer, a Debbie Downer. You know, you know, one of the reasons is, is this, that a, that a grumpy person or a complainer is a turnoff, very unattractive. You know, you, you can be very physically attractive and you can be very talented or educated or hardworking or, or even very loving. But if you are a complainer, that's what dominates the the persona, it, it, it dwarfs all the other things in your life, and, and it's, it's really what people notice. It'll be what you're known for, are known by. You know, it's nice to be around that person, and they're smart and caring, but they complain about everything. Don't look at your spouse. See, complaining makes our lives miserable and does the same thing for others. 
God's word is described as, as a mirror, and it will reveal who and what you are. You know, it seems like some people will complain about anything. You could give them a million dollars, and they go, oh, great. I got to pay taxes. <laughs> See, there's already somebody complaining about it. <laughs> the government's going to abuse the spending of my taxes. And, you know, on and on it goes. You could give them all that money. And, and complaining, basically, I think, is dishonoring to God. It said God doesn't satisfy that God can't make me content. It's like a, an outsider who doesn't know the Lord sees a believer who just constantly complains and says, why would I be interested in a God who can't produce a grateful person? I mean, at least you would think he could do that. And, and, and people hear it. And God hears it. You know, while the children of Israel were in the wilderness for 40 years, talk about lack of gratitude, talk about constant complaining. I mean, here, here they were. They'd been saved from being slaves. They were slaves. 400 years they had been there in Egypt, and, and they left with great possessions. They left with wealth. They were set free. Their, their firstborn male children were being drowned in the, in the river, the Nile River. And now they're totally free with all of these possessions led by a cloud by day and a fire by night and manna coming down from heaven and water coming out of a rock. And they still constantly complained. L listen to a, a passage from, from Numbers. I'll just read it to you, chapter 11. It says, now when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. For the Lord heard it. It's, that's, that's interesting, isn't it? The Lord hears what we say and what we do. He heard it. His anger was aroused. And so the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. The Lord heard it. The Lord hears our complaining. It tells us in chapter 14. So in same, same book, Numbers, chapter 14, this is the... Israelites in the wilderness. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried. The people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron and the whole congregation. Here's what they said. If only we had died in the land of Egypt or if only we had died in the wilderness. What a bunch of complainers on their way to the promised land, complaining about everything. It goes on and on and on. And it says the Lord even spoke to Moses in Numbers chapter 14. And here's what he said. How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I've heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Well, the Lord goes, I, I, I am just, I, I've, I've delivered them, I've fed them, I've led them, I've taken care of them, and all they can do is complain. You know, there's a, there's a great passage in, in the book of um, Philippians that talks about uh, giving thanks and not being a, a complainer, and I'll just read it to you. It's in Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. Here's what it says. Do all things without complaining. Put that in your kid's bedroom on a big sign. <laughs> Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Isn't that interesting that he would say that's what makes you shine, that's what makes you be seen in that generation, that you're not a complainer and a disputer, a, an arguer. It's, it's not a, an attractive attribute. No one says, hey, let's get together with the Hatfields. Man, can they complain? And I can't think of a better way to spend my time than listening to all their litany of issues. I don't think so. A life filled with blessing, with the Lord's care and provision, 
should not be complaints, but gratitude and praise. As Psalm 92 opens up with that, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a great passage to remember. It's good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. To give thanks. We, we've, we've been given so much. And to express gratitude, it's what he's given us. And here's what I have to say about it. What the Lord gives you, the world can't take away. He's given it to you. And, and here in the, this psalm, it says in verse 2, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. He gives us some instruction of how to wake up in the morning each day to, re, to remind our hearts, to, to remind ourselves that today I'm going to experience his loving kindness. I wake up in the morning. You can wake up in the morning, Psalm 92, and you can say, you know what? Today I get to declare your loving kindness, to remember it. All I do, all I experience today, Lord, with, with a God-honoring expectancy that your love is going to be in my life. Your care is going to be there. To recognize today that, that God will keep all the promises that he's made in his word to me because of his loving kindness towards me. To wake up that way. Now, now, now not all days are easy. We all have storms. We all have days of rain. We all have days of sunshine. But as a Christian, at least I can wake up every day and say this, I know he loves me. I know he loves me. My wife hates me right now, but the Lord <laughs> loves me. However that may come out. Jeremiah, even in, in the book of Lamentations, which is a book of lament. When Jerusalem was, was, was destroyed and he had, he had warned and he had suffered, he, he still said this, and let me read it to you from, from Jeremiah from the book of Lamentations. He says, through the Lord's mercies, we're not consumed because his compassions fail not. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O Lord. The Lord is my portion says my soul, therefore I hope in him. Even in the midst of, of great distress, he would say that. In, in Romans chapter 8, listen to these verses. It says, and this is a powerful statement that, that the apostle Paul would make when he went through all kinds of difficulties, all kinds of trials. And here's the thing we all do. But Paul would say this. What will separate us from the love of Christ? I, I wake up in the morning and I, I, can, I can declare his loving kindness. What will separate me from? Shall tribulation, our distress, our persecution, our famine, our nakedness, our peril, our sword? As it is written, we're killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And so that's why the psalmist can say, as he wakes up every morning, it's good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, and to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. At night, his faithfulness. In the morning, I remember his love. But at night, I, 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 I look back on my day and I look back on what's happened. I go, okay, Lord, I recognize, I see and I praise you for it, your love and your faithfulness. And so, so, so right at the beginning of this psalm, he gives us a way to begin and end each day. He shares it with us. He tells us about it. On an instrument of ten strings, on the lute and on the harp, verse 3, with harmonious sounds, for you, Lord, have made me glad. Your work I will triumph 
and the work of your hands. The work of your hands. I think part of what he's talking about there is God's creation. All the design and beauty and gifts of nature that we know have come from him. They're not happenstance. They're not an accident. It's not a, you know, a, some kind of freak thing that happens in nature. But the work of his hands. Lord, I, I recognize the work of your hands, and I'll be glad. I'll, I'll triumph in them. I'll speak of them. But, but also the work of his hands, I believe, as he causes the fulfillment of Scripture and prophecy to come to bear among us. You see it happening. You watch it. And you have to step back and say, okay, Lord, we're in the midst of the work of your hands, not just the creation around us, but as things are coming together, as you prophesied, as you declared in your word. I had a friend who said the world is not out of control. It's not falling apart, but it's falling into place. Amen. Just as the sovereign almighty God who sits and rules and reigns on high has designed it to. He's in charge. He, he tells us here in this, this psalm, verse 5, O oh, oh Lord, how great are your works. And I love this part. Listen to what it says. Your thoughts are very deep. He's giving thanks to the Lord for his deep thoughts. Things that God has, has, has given to us, things he's thought, things he's done that are beyond our comprehension that we can only know by his word and by his spirit. No matter how high your IQ, no matter how many degrees or doctorates or masters you may have, you would never know some of the things that we know without God revealing his deep thoughts to us by his spirit and his word. Creation. Man's fallen nature. Why we are here, the origin of death and evil. The question that everyone asks, what happens when I die? God gives it to us in his word, his deep thoughts. Those are all unknown mysteries outside of God's thoughts and heart revealed by revelation through scripture. And nowhere are the deep thoughts of God seen more clearly and more powerful than in the plan of salvation. God shares his deepest heart, his deepest thoughts that a holy, righteous God would have a relationship with a sinner like John Bixby. How could that be possible? And yet he does. How can he do that and still show us his love? The cross shows us how, how, how wrong, destructive, and deadly our lifestyles and choices are. Sin, sin, is, sin is deadly, Amen. and it demands justice. It demands punishment, but, but God deals with it in a way that, that, that's amazing. The, the deep thoughts of God, that God would join together love and justice, judgment and forgiveness, death and life together on the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's powerful. Amen. You look at it and you just go, oh my gosh, you, you think, how is God going to solve the problem of a, of a sinful mankind, bring him into relationship with him when God can't even look upon sin? He says, I, I'll do it in a way because of my love and because of my faithfulness. And no one can ever say when you see Jesus on the cross, no one can ever say, well, sin's no big deal. Oh, it is a big deal. It's a huge deal. So, so, so big that, that God would have to sacrifice his only son. And the cross allows God to be holy and just and sinless and pure and yet have a relationship with people like you and I. Is that amazing? The, the deep thoughts of God. He says, he says oh, Lord, how, how great are your works. Your thoughts are very deep. It's good to praise him for deep answers to questions that every person asks, the saved and the unsaved. How did I get here? Where do I go after this? How do I get rid of my guilt, my shame? Is there a God and can I know him? 
and the scripture, the deep thoughts of God given to us in his word as it, as it unravels all the way from Genesis to Revelation. God saying, yes, you can know me and this is where you came from and this is how you got to where you are and this is how I can bring you back to myself if you're willing to come. And he very graciously and lovingly reveals to us his deep thoughts. It says, when the wicked spring up in verse 7, like grass, and when all the works of the iniquity flourish, it is that they may be destroyed forever. But you, Lord, you, Lord, are, are on high forevermore. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. The wickedness he saves us out of. He, he brings us through. No, no longer will we perish in our sins. God will judge. And we can see the, the battle going on in our world today for the hearts and the souls and the lives of people. You can watch it on the news. You can watch it in the culture. You can watch it in the schools. You can, you can watch it in the politics. You can, you can see this, this, this war going on for the hearts and minds of, of, of individuals and for people. I think you see it in the abortion battle. I'm amazed at the callousness of hearts today. You can see it in the confusion of the LGBT and, and transgender movement that's, that's trying to grip the heart of America. You can see it in the drug legalization that's seeping into our country. You can see it in the pornography industry. You can see it in the love of money and power and, 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 a, and a nation that wants to cast off any restrictions whatsoever. And let's just live any way we want to live. But God is just. And he will judge an unrepentant mankind. But he offers hope. Verse 10, as, as he goes on of this, this thought of thankfulness, but my horn you have exalted like a wild ox. I've been anointed with fresh oil. A horn in the Old Testament was a symbol of power, a symbol of strength. To thank and praise him for the power to live a transformed life. You know, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 has always been a life verse for me. It's one the Lord gave me early in my Christianity. It was, you know, if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things pass away. Behold, all things become new. And it, it kept me from saying and, and using that excuse, well, that's just the way I am. I loved what Chuck Smith would always say about that, but that's not how you were born again. You're born again with a transformed life, no longer condemned to live a life for fleshly and self-focused desires, but set free from that, given a power because of Christ to live for him, not just for me. And that's a powerful freedom. That's an amazing transformation. Verse, verse 10 says, but my horn you have exalted like a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. And, and oil is always a symbol of the, the Holy Spirit in Scripture. It's, it's, he says there's a fresh anointing. I, I love this statement. I, I can have, according to Scripture, a fresh filling and anointing of his Spirit over and over and over again in my life. You know why? Because I need it. All the different circumstances and situations you find in, yourself in, he can bring, and he does bring, and I'm sure you've experienced, uh, a sense of his presence, which can be very fresh. You're in, a, in prayer, or you're in a worship service, or you're in a situation, and all of a sudden you say, oh my gosh, the Lord is here. He's with me. His power to walk through something or into something that you're like, you know, I don't want to step into this. I called him a man this, this week who's, who lost his wife. They were married for many, many years, and he had been by her bedside. He'd been kind of recluse for two years. He'd been by her. She'd had a stroke. And, and I called him this week, and, and I said, hey, just wanted to talk to you. He says, I know, I've just, I haven't been anywhere in two years. He said, when my wife had this stroke and she began to go downhill, I told the Lord, Lord, I can't do this. I, I can't do this. 
And he says, John, you know what the Lord said to me? I said, no, but I'm listening. He said, don't you dare miss this. And he said, it was the most amazing experience of my life to sit by her bedside and serve her for those two years. And God gave him, I believe, a fresh sense of his presence and a fresh sense of his power, a fresh sense of his peace, his joy. It says, you know, you have given me, anointed me with fresh oil. Don't, don't, don't ever lose the reverence and awe of what has been given to you in Jesus Christ. Don't let it slip out of your life. Don't, don't, don't become apathetic toward it or take it for granted. See, I, I know who I was before I came to Christ. You know, there's, a, there's an amazing story in, in the gospel of, of, of Luke in, in where Jesus uh, ask a rhetorical question. I'm, sh I'm sure you've, you've heard this story. You've, 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 you've listened to it. It's in Luke chapter 11. It has to do with this sense of fresh oil and fresh anointing from the Lord. Jesus says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given. Seek and you'll find knock and it will be open to you. And it's just, it's the, the, the language here is to keep doing that throughout your life. Don't stop. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and he, to him who knocks, it'll be open. And then there's this rhetorical question. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead? If he asks for an egg, will he give him a Scorpion omelet? No, I don't think so. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? That, that fresh sense of his anointing, that fresh oil. This is what the psalmist is speaking of here in, in Psalm 92. He says, you, you give me that, that, that fresh oil. You've made me strong. You've, you've exalted my, my horn, he says. It's, 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 a, it's an amazing verse. But my horn you've exalted like a wild ox. I've been anointed with fresh oil, the oil of the Spirit. And situations and circumstances over and over and over again, I can say this, it's good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. Then he goes on, verse 12, the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. And the, the palm tree he speaks of is the ones that grow there in Israel, and it's a date palm. It's, it's to, to thank and praise him for the privilege of, of living a clean and forgiven life, a, a fruitful life, because those, those palms produce all kinds of dates, a clean life. There in those verses 12 and 13, you, you'll flourish, you'll grow. To be, to be free to grow, free from alcohol and drugs and immorality and bitterness. He, he sets you free so that you can put your roots into something else and not get stuck. You know, I, when I first became a Christian, I, I had all kinds of, of baggage. And one of my biggest baggages was I grew up in a home where I didn't really have a good dad. And, and, you know, I never had a dad who took me on a vacation. He never took me fishing. He, 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 he never, you know, came to my football games when I played City League. He just, was, he just wasn't around. He didn't care. He didn't, didn't involve himself. So it always, so I came to Christ, and, I, and that was still, you know, God, why didn't you give me a good dad? It's all these pastor kids and their, you know, deacon kids with their godly fathers and they were there at the college and, you know, I'd, and I'd be walking across campus and I'd see them hanging out. i go, you know, God, why didn't you give me a dad? And it's like the Lord spoke to me one day and he goes, John, your dad isn't a victim of the enemy. He's not the enemy. And you would be just like him if I hadn't saved you. Amen. And I thought, 
you're right. But I do have a father in heaven who I can praise every morning. I can wake up every morning and, and, and I can thank him for his love. And then I can look back every day at the end of the day and say, Lord, your faithfulness is amazing. Amen. It's amazing. We, we have been given freedom to, to step away from bitterness and, and the, the inability to live a good life. We can live one because of him. We have a way to wake up, a way to go to bed. And, and it tells, here, tells us here that the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree and he shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. In other words, what he's saying is not only can you be fruitful, but you can be stable and strong. Like a cedar. We have our roots going deep into a spiritual life. And I would also submit to you, not only into a spiritual life, but into a community of spiritual people. And we, we just finished a six-week study in our home with, uh, with about marriage. My wife and I hosted a connect group. And it was so great just to be sitting in our house with a community of people who had the same desire and interest based on Scripture, and that was to have a marriage that would last, that would be good, not just exist, to, to be putting your roots in a, in a spiritual life and in a spiritual community that go deep into something that, that is healthy and righteous. There's a lot of things you can invest in that are not healthy and righteous, he, he, he continues this, this, this psalm. It's all coming from singing praises, and he's given all these reasons to do so. They shall bear fruit. I like this one in verse 14, in old age. <laughs> they shall be fresh and flourishing in old age. We get to praise God and give him thanks that, 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 that in this life, and you don't, this doesn't happen in too many things, that things get better with him with age. Spiritually, things grow richer, more real, more, more tested and tried, more true, more sure. As we walk with him and experience his loving kindness in the morning and his faithfulness at night, as, as age comes, he says, they shall still bear fruit and they shall be fresh and flourishing. You know, one thing I could never imagine is growing old without Jesus. That's a scary thing. But here is a life that can still bear fruit. You know, yesterday... My wife and I celebrated 45 years of marriage. 45 years. And, and it's like a blink of an eye. We, we got married here in Gulf Breeze. We lived our whole life in here. In this, we started a church in 1983. And, you know, Lynn has this, this cliche she always uses from the Bonnie and Clyde movie where she looks over at me and says, Clyde, I thought we was going somewhere, but we was just going. <laughs> so we've been going up and down 98 for, for, for 45 years, a little more crowded than it used to be. But, but here's the deal. Life can still bear fruit and still can be richer and still flourish as you get older. We, we just went up to the mountains for a brief trip last week, and my son Ryan was up there with his four kids staying in a cabin. My cousin owns a, a house on a lake up in North Carolina, and we stayed there. And Neil and his family came up with his six kids. Oh, my gosh, they stayed in the house with us. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody came up and saw pictures and said, oh, what a blessing. I go, yeah, it was a blessing. <laughs> They're great kids, but here's the thing with kids. They're kids. <laughs> and we haven't lived with six kids in a while. We never lived with six kids, actually. <laughs> That's a production. Pray for Neil. <laughs> but I, I, lo I love this statement here in Psalm 92. They shall be fresh and flourishing. And even in old age, you're fresh. Uh, there, there's a great passage about this, I, I believe, that, that uh, the Apostle Paul coined 
And it's, it's a statement that he made that I think uh, kind of echoes this same sentiment of the psalmist. He says this, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. And if you're, if you're past your 50s, you know what that means. You know, he says, we don't lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. That, that's the story of Psalm 92 as you come to the end of it, as he's speaking of the fact that you can have this, this aging thing going on, but you can still bear fruit and you can still be fresh and flourishing. And the privilege of an older person is to declare from a long life of knowing him and walking with him. He says it in verse 15, he says, to declare that the Lord is upright, that he's, that he's righteous, that he's good. To, to know that. To, 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 to realize that you can still be fresh and, and stable. The, the privilege is, is, is you, you never have to be ashamed if you put your trust in him. You know, I came to the Lord at, at, at an early age. At least it, it seemed old to me at that time. I was 18, but life had just gotten so crazy. And, and when I came to the Lord, everything changed. And, and I, I realize now at this time in my life, I don't have to be ashamed of, of anything that he's given me. And that, that you become, he says here, to declare the Lord is upright. He's my rock. He's sure. He's steady. He's solid. And, and, and as you get older, as, you, as, you, as it talks here, as the end here, to, to, that the, they shall bear fruit in old age and declare the Lord is upright, that he's my rock. An older person can say, yeah, he's my rock. And they can say it with much confidence because older people know how quickly things change in life and how many times they can change. They, they can identify with that. And they can say with great confidence, you know what? The, the, the circumstances can change. Health can change. Your kids can change. Finances can change. But he never changes. He stays the same. He doesn't change, he hasn't changed, and he never will fail or change. He's a rock, that's what it says. He's my rock. There's no unrighteousness in him. What are you building your life on? What are you trusting in? To, to live a life of, of thanksgiving because of him. I love the way this psalm uh, says it to us. It, it's good. It's good to give thanks to the Lord. No one can take that away from you. It's good to give thanks to, and to sing his praises to his name. And, and every morning to wake up and, and, and realize, you know what, this may not be the day I wanted it to be. I may not be facing what I wanted to face. I may not be feeling what I wanted to be. But one thing I can say is, Lord, you love me today. And I declare your loving kindness in the morning. And when I lay my head on that pillow at night, your faithfulness every night, I can be grateful for that. I can be thankful for that. Morning, sometimes they say, well, when he, when he uses that phrase there at the beginning, he's saying morning, he's talking about your youth. I think of your loving kindness. And then that, as I grow old, Lord, I, I think of your faithfulness from start to finish. And I pray that if you're here today, you've had that new start with the Lord. That, that you've experienced that, that amazing miracle of forgiveness in your life. You know what it's like to, 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 to experience the freshness of his spirit in your heart and life over and over again. And if you've never trusted in his love, if you've never laid your grief and your cares and your pain and your failures at the cross, well, he would invite you to do that. He would say, come home. And what a home it is. Listen to what the psalmist says. It's good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, 
to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. Lord, we, we thank you. We sing your praises together. We honor you. We, we, we take some time this morning to gather in this place and recognize that it's your loving kindness that has given us everything we have. And Lord, your faithfulness is so obvious over and over again. And so, Lord, as we step into this week of thanksgiving, as we head into this time of, of gathering together and giving thanks, may we most of all give thanks for your love and your faithfulness in our lives. Every morning and every night, may we never forget how you've rescued us and how you've given us a fresh sense of your spirit and that you're our rock. And as the years go by and the, the days go by, we thank you for the freshness that you pour into our lives. Lord, may none of us find ourselves characterized or marked by just constant complaining, but of gratitude to a God who deserves it more than anything. Our faithfulness, our love. We thank you, Lord for all that you are and all that you've given and how you revealed yourself to us over and over and over again. May we never grow apathetic or tired, but press in. Lord, it's good to give thanks and to sing your praises.